getting started now. Um, and I am pleased to welcome um, Patrick Twagiro Yezu, um, who is zooming in from Ottawa, joining in uh, on from the East Coast today. And um, I am uh, just going to give you a little bit of background um, about um, uh, Lincoln Alexander, but um, Patrick will be doing a little bit more. Uh, so many of you uh, may have heard of Lincoln Alexander. Um, he was Canada's first Black member of Parliament. Um, and he was an immigrant um, to Canada, and he served as an example to many um, because he built his life around service in Canada um, through his um, engagement with the the government as well as through education. Um, and uh, he was um, just uh, his birthday was yesterday, so so that's why today is Lincoln Alexander Day, or yesterday was Lincoln Alexander Day, but we are honoring him today. Um, he served in the Royal Canadian Air Force and eventually graduated with a law degree from Osgood um, Hall Law School, but there's going to be a lot more um, that Patrick is going to share with us. Um, and a little bit about Patrick himself. Um, Patrick is a labor and employment lawyer with uh, Iman Harnden in Ottawa, and he's fully bilingual in English and French and works with both the public and private sector um, in all aspects of labor and employment law, helping employers solve a wide variety of workplace issues. And he also works in <clears throat> areas of education law, civil civic uh, litigation, privacy law, human rights law, administrative law, and corporate governance. So uh, lots and lots of expertise here. Um, and not only that, um, Patrick is very active in the community and participates in uh, lots of fundraising and charitable events, um, such as with uh, organizations in his local community, and um, has, has also been honored through um, the Ontario Ministry of Education, the Governor General of Canada, uh, United Way Ottawa, and the Association of Fundraising Professionals um, in the World Economic Forum and uh, l'Assemblée de la Francophonie de l'Ontario. So um, so this is a great honor to have um, Patrick uh, joining us today. So um, we'll do a, a short presentation by Patrick and then we'll open it up um, to the question and answer session. I'll lead off, but I'll also moderate questions that come in through the chat. Um, and if anybody uh, would like to have um, captions on, um, feel free to use that um, option under the three dots uh, in your bottom, bottom of the Zoom uh, menu under more. Uh, you should be able to pull that up for, for captions. Okay, thank you so much. And I will hand it over to you, Patrick. Yeah, thanks for having me today. I uh, certainly am I'm glad to be here and talking about, uh, you know, one of my personal uh, heroes, but uh, I know that someone who's who's a hero to many, I, I will state that it's always funny um, to hear people uh, reference uh, someone from Ottawa as being on the on the East Coast because to me the East Coast is like as past uh, obviously is is the the Atlantic or the Maritimes. And I was just actually there a couple of days ago um, in Newfoundland, but uh, but I do I do acknowledge that yeah this is the <laughs> East Coast in comparison to where you are. So it's uh, certainly a factual statement. Um, <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll first start by talking about uh, you know Lincoln Alexander as was just mentioned uh, about sort of his 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 early life. Um, uh, you know his professional success and his legacy, and then uh, open it up to to some questions uh, after that. So I'll start by discussing, um, you know, what what you all may already know that the roles that he occupied, or or sort of how he came to those roles. What's important to know in that respect is that um, Lincoln Alexander was the oldest son of uh, Caribbean immigrant parents. His mother uh, was from Jamaica, and his father was from Saint Vincent and the uh, Grenadines. And at the time, job opportunities were very limited for Black Canadians. So his father was a carpenter by trade. He worked as a sleeping car porter for the Canadian uh, Pacific Railway, and his mother worked as a maid. So obviously, as you can um, imagine, there were limited opportunities at the time for his parents. Um, and after his father and mother uh, separated when he was a teenager, uh, Lincoln Alexander lived with his mother in Harlem, and that was in New York City for a few years. And it was in Harlem that Alexander encountered role models with uh, greater positions than those available to Black men in Canada. Uh, and he later wrote that this experience in Harlem sort of stiffened his resolve to be more than just a porter. Um, and certainly uh, saying that in, in the context of, of understanding that there's nothing wrong with uh, with being a porter, but as you can imagine, perhaps his parents wanted him um, to, to maybe pursue something um, that was that was a little different in terms of uh, of labor. 
Um, and so he returned to Toronto in 1939, uh, shortly after the start of the Second World War, uh, 1939. And though he was too young to enlist, he worked as a machinist as a uh, at a factory in Hamilton, making uh, anti-aircraft guns for the war effort. Now, in 1942, Alexander joined the Royal Canadian Air Forces. Um, at the time, the branch of the armed forces that often restricted non-whites from entering service. So, you know, he was already breaking uh, the mold and breaking barriers very, very early on in his in his career. And uh, because he had poor eyesight, he was not eligible for combat. So he trained instead as a wireless operator, and he served with the uh, British Commonwealth Air Training Plan um, in Portage, La Prairie, Manitoba, where he was uh, honorably discharged in 1945. And so at the time of his, his honorable discharge, he uh, held the rank of, of corporal. So already you can tell that as he was progressing through different um, avenues of life, whether it was his, um, his service in terms of the armed forces, um, he, he was already someone that was very, very, uh, very different in terms of, uh, um, in, in terms of uh, breaking barriers and creating opportunities. And I'll note that, you know, his reference to his the time spent in Harlem, um, to those of you that have ever may have just a general interest in black history, um, you know, Harlem is sort of a, 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 a bastion of, of, uh, of, of richness of black history, at least on the American side, um, in the sense that you know, during the time he was there, he would have been exposed to um, a lot of uh, people that were influential in terms of uh, the cultural advancement of, 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 of the Black identity, uh, the political advancement of the Black identity, um, but as well as all other different aspects, debates, uh, conversations, and again, a, po a different political landscape for um, African Americans and perhaps what would have been the case in Canada, um, but nonetheless, probably very inspiring uh, for a young man, uh, a, a young black man living in Western society to be exposed to. And, and his next stage of, of life uh, sort of came the law and politics portion of things. And so after the Second World War, uh, Lincoln Alexander turned to higher education. And, you know, this the importance of this was sort of echo throughout his, his life and, and his writings. Um, but he earned a bachelor from McMaster University in 1949 followed by a degree from Osgood Hall Law School in 1953. And uh, Alexander first practiced uh, uh, law at a law firm in Hamilton before starting his own law firm. In 1965, he was appointed Queen's Counsel, an honorary title that recognizes a lawyer's contribution to the legal profession. Now, Alexander's ambition began to shift from law to politics uh, later on in, in, in the 1960s, let's say. Uh, in his memoir, Go to School, You're a Little Black Boy, that's the title of the, the memoir, and I certainly encourage any of you to read it. Um, he mentions that uh, a 1960 tour through some of 23 African nations that had significant impact on um, his point of view. So in, in that particular book, he actually states that the experience was an eye opener for me, not only as a lawyer, but also as a human being, because I began to realize what black people could do. I saw that, unlike the Hollywood version, these Africans were men and women of significant talents. I became conscious of my blackness and I had come from a white uh, world. Now we were in Africa and I realized we are people of skill and creativity. I was a black man and I was a somebody. I started standing tall. And so, you know, here he speaks to how being exposed to that environment and seeing um, and perhaps breaking whatever stereotypical views he may have had of of, of African nations or African people at the time um, really sort of opened his eyes and, and instilled some level of pride in his in his black identity. And so I think that, um, you know, from from that point on, you would see him take that responsibility um, in a very, very important manner. But he did so in a humble way, uh, which I'll address in, in a second. In 1965, he entered politics. He ran as a conservative member of parliament for Hamilton West. Um, but was defeated by less than 2,500 votes his first time running. And three years later, on uh, June 25, 1968, he won the seat, making him the first Black Canadian to sit in the House of Commons. And in his first speech before the House of Commons uh, in September of 1968, he stated that I am not the spokesperson for Black Canadians. And, 
and I, I use black Canadians in parentheses here. It's not necessarily the word that he used, but but that's you know that's sort of what what I'll operate. Um, and he then stated that that honor has not been given to me. Uh, so do not let me ever give anyone that impression. However, I want the record to show that I accept the responsibility for speaking for them and all others in this great nation who feel that they are the subjects of discrimination because of race, creed, or color. So I think that in, for, for anyone who's sort of a, a trailblazer or a first, um, or even a, a minority in any setting, there's a reluctance to sort of take on the mantle of, of, of speaking for an entire group, um, because there, there isn't really a sense that any group has any monolithic views of any issue, right? And so I think that what's what's interesting about Alexander is that in this moment he he acknowledged that he you know I, I'm glad to sort of take the responsibility of representing this, but um, by no means should anyone conclude that I'm actually an official spokesperson for any particular group. Um, and so I think that the, the the importance of that shows a, a level of humility um, that came with that responsibility. Uh, whereas surely uh, you know some some people may take that moment and and really hold the mantle of of, of spokesperson. Um, it wasn't in Alexander's nature to um, to sort of fall on that end. He really wanted to to show that he he was happy to take the responsibility. But you know uh, this isn't about me. This is about the issues that that are being faced and and wanting um, to provide a voice for those issues. And he didn't limit it to. Um, you know, the black community. He really spoke of anyone who, who may have been uh, victimized by discrimination as a result of their, their creed, their race, or their identity. He was reelected four times, and he served a total of 12 years in parliament. And in 1979, he was appointed Minister of Labor in the Joe Clark government, becoming the first black Canadian to serve in cabinet. In 1980, he resigned his seat when uh, Ontario Bill Premier... Uh, when Ontario Premier Bill Davis appointed him chair of the Ontario Walk Workers' Compensation Board, where he served for five years. Later on, um, he would become Lieutenant Governor. So on uh, September 20, 1985, Lincoln Alexander was sworn in as Ontario's 24th Lieutenant Governor, uh, the first Black Canadian to be appointed to a vice-regal position in Canada. And as Lieutenant Governor, Alexander was able to take an active role in the multicultural affairs of Ontario, um, and his mandate was to fight racism, advance the cause of youth, and advocate for seniors. In 1991, um, when, he, uh, when his term in office was up, Alexander accepted a post as Chancellor of the University of Guelph, uh, where he served as an unprecedented, where he served an unprecedented five terms. Uh, and after he was succeeded by uh, Pamela Wallen in 2007, he was named Chancellor Emeritus. In 2000, Alexander was appointed chair of the Canadian Race Relations Foundation, an organization uh, dedicated to ending racism and, and racial discrimination in Canada. So I'd now like to speak um, a bit about his legacy. And I think this is a, a pretty crucial point um, you know, Lincoln Alexander, and I've heard many people liken him to being sort of the, you know, the, the, the Canadian Martin Luther King, if you will. Um, and, and others have referenced uh, him as potentially being an, an Obama. You know, he wasn't prime minister. And it's not to say that there's, you know, you, you value one more than the other. But, you know, the truth is he's sort of a sort of a mix of, of all those people. Um, and, and, and so much as you know, he was certainly an advocate, um, someone who uh, wanted to shake the system and, and, and openly spoke out about that. Um, but in other respects, he was, he was, you know, an active member within the system. I mean, there's no denying that. I think that, um, you know, for all of the accomplishments that Martin Luther King had on the American side, you know, Martin Luther King was not uh, an agent of the government. He was not, um, He's not somebody who was uh, an elected member of uh, of, of uh, the House of Representatives in the states or the Senate, um, and so you know he, he wasn't uh, he, he wasn't a, an official player within the, that system, if you will. Uh, and so Lincoln Alexander can be distinguished in that sense, and perhaps more more likened to people like John Lewis, um, who started out as agitators and then went into politics and became a representative in the House of 
of representatives um, in, in, in the states or other people such as um, uh, such as Reverend Jesse Jackson, who, uh, you know, also started out as an activist and, and sort of, you know, played more of an official role within the confines of politics and, and went even as far as running for president. And then obviously uh, later on examples um, like Barack Obama, who was a senator and then eventually became president of the United States. And so, you know, Lincoln Alexander sort of set a number of firsts in that respect, right? So he was very active in the political sphere, um, active in the sense that, you know, a first, a first and, and an example for many. Uh, I think that even his role within the legal context was was interesting because um, he became a lawyer at a time where, um, you know, people of color or, or, or women or other people that belong to minority groups weren't as active uh, or as present within that space, right? And so you can imagine that it was probably a very isolating um, world for him, whether professionally as a lawyer or eventually once he entered politics. Um, but what seems sort of ongoing when you look at him, when you look at interviews, when you look at his um, uh, when you look at his statements, is that there was a, a, a very, very strong level of optimism within him. Um, and he sort of seems to be one of those people that once he realized that um, he could do things uh, for others, he really went all in with that mindset. And and he never looked back and never seemed to sort of doubt that ultimately um, he, he could succeed and do things for people. Now, the other key thing is that, you know, he wasn't, um, you know, Alexander wasn't, wasn't too keen on sort of um, airbrushing Canada's history for the purpose of, um, you know, for the purpose of being a spokesperson for, you know, sort of a, a, a kumbaya society or something like that. He, you know, he openly talked about that Canada did have problems. Um, and, and, you know, one of my favorite quotes of his is the statement that, um, you know, Canada is not perfect. It's not perfect. By no means is it perfect. But it's certainly, in his eyes, the best was the best country in the world. Um, and, and, you know, from a from a subjective perspective, how could it not be? You know, his parents show up to this country as immigrants and they've got nothing. And, and you know, he essentially rises all the way to becoming uh, a historic figure in this country, um, achieving historic things and, and serving as a role model for many people um, across the country. So I think that, um, you know, I, one of the things that I appreciate about him is, is that he wasn't he wasn't afraid to be critical uh, of, of Canada. Um, but still held it in a light that, that, you know, that Canada, and I would sort of say that I view it the same way, um, it's not so much a place as it is an aspiration, right? I mean, we, um, you know, we're not always going to live up to the ideals of what we can be, um, but but we the whole point is to aspire to be better. And I think that he embodied that in his actions, um, and, and he certainly um, has, just through his example, uh, come to be exactly the sort of thing that demonstrates that, um, you know, a lot of things are possible in this country, um, regardless of who you are, obviously it takes a lot of hard work. You've got to, you know, be ready to endure a lot of things as, as he clearly did. Um, but that there can be light at the end of that tunnel. And, and, and you know what, sometimes there may not be, and, and that's not something that he, he, you know, tried to hide, but sometimes you, you may face difficulties. Um, but I think that that's sort of his, his legacy, um, is, is embedded in that. And, and over the past couple of years, I mean, he passed away in, in 2012. Um, you know, the key thing that sort of has come out about him time and time again, is that he had sound judgment, that he was a compassionate uh, human being. And, you know, as a result, we now see uh, a number of schools that are named after him. Um, we, we, we know that there's an expressway in Hamilton that's named after him. Um, but also just a few days ago, uh, a bust of, of uh, Lincoln Alexander uh, designed by by a Canadian artist was unveiled at Queen's Park, right? And that was uh, as a result of, of many efforts, both within government and outside to fund the creation of this bust, which is which is amazing. And even before that, I mean, on November 28, 2013, the Legislative Assembly of Ontario uh, declared that January 21st of each year would be Lincoln Alexander Day. Um, and, and they sort of cited that his life was an example of service, determination and humility. Um, and they indicated that he always fought for equal rights for all races in our society and doing so without malice. He changed attitudes and contributed greatly to the inclusiveness 
and tolerance of Canada today. In 2015, Lincoln Alexander Day became something that's observed Canada wide, um, which is certainly important. And for me, a few years ago, um, just as I was completing, I just completed law school and was was um, articling at at the law firm that I now work at as a lawyer. And um, you know, Lincoln Alexander Day was coming up, and sort of discussions were being had about whether or not there might be an interest in in, in maybe writing about it. And uh, I wrote a piece about uh, Lincoln Alexander and sort of the impact that he's had on Canada. Um, but, you know, sort of on a more personal level, people such as myself, um, you know, young black men or, or, or young, young people of color in general, because his story um, so much relates to what a lot of us have experienced, whether it's watching your parents, um, you know, who immigrated here sort of you know, work difficult jobs to try and give you a better life. And, and, and when you're younger, it's very difficult to understand that, right? It's difficult to understand the concept of sacrifice, but for them, you know, they're not looking for you to become the first, you know, everything that there is to be. Uh, they're, they're really just interested in, uh, in seeing you succeed and, and do well and, and live a life that you can um, be proud of and be dignified in and to treat people with respect. And I think that he embodies sort of those hopes and dreams of, of, of parents in those situations at the highest level. And so for me, one of my favorite sort of ex opportunities was when I was uh, early on in my undergrad, when I worked as a, a guide on Parliament Hill, uh, I'd have the chance to, to bring in guests from, from all over um, Canada, uh, who would come visit uh, Center Block at Parliament and, you know, give them a tour. And, and, and we had the opportunity to choose our own themes. And my theme was um, bilingualism, multiculturalism, and diversity. Uh, you know, in what way is that sort of uh, expressed through the halls of Parliament? And one of my favorite stories was, was talking about Lincoln Alexander and talking about, um, you know, what what he meant and 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 sort of who he was as a person and as a representative and to me it was sort of a, it was always a, an an incredible moment because you know I, I moved here with with my family when I was younger and and so there's obviously those those sort of uh, there's those there are those links but but you're there and, and I mean here I am as as a student walking in the halls of Parliament um, talking about someone like Lincoln Alexander so you know. I didn't go as far as uh, you know being elected a member of parliament, but but uh, you know the 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 link is there. There I was in the in the halls of parliament, um, speaking to people who, in, in a lot of cases, have just moved here. You know, when you move to Ottawa or when you're coming in from a new country or a different country, you know, one of the first things you're going to do is visit parliament and um, and you know talking to newcomers whose kids were with them about you know, Lincoln Alexander's story, and in some respects, my own experience and the experiences of those that I know. Um, I think there's something really, really inspirational about that. Um, and the fact that he wasn't airbrushing it, he wasn't talking about us being perfect. And so, you know, the, the honesty and the fact that you're going to face challenges, um, but but that ultimately Canada is is aspirational, right? It's, it's, some, it's, it's not a place, it's an idea to me. Others may describe it... Uh, Otherwise, but but to me, it's it's an idea, and it's something that we can always sort of work towards um, improving, work towards um, getting to, and and because it's it's an idea, it'll never be perfect. Uh, we're always going to fall short, um, but sort of the the value comes in trying, and so I think that that's the the enduring legacy that that Lincoln Alexander has has left, um, and I think that his 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 inspirational sort of uh, the, the inspirational dynamic to what he represents isn't only relevant to, um, you know, people of color, right? It's, it's relevant to, uh, to everyone. I think to every Canadian, the idea that, um, you know, we have to be, that, that we should be embedded into a culture of civic engagement where we're all called to give back. I think that's important. Um, but the other piece, you know, this notion that we're, we're not, you know, it's not just about what you do for yourself to some extent, who you are will be defined by by what you do for others, and it can be as simple as you know you're a decent human being, and you know you're compassionate and you care for others and you're there for them, uh, or it can be you know proactively sort of seeking to mount projects that that help improve your own community, uh, your own province, your own country, 
and and so I think that uh, the, there's a lesson in in all of that, and and I think that uh, you know that's probably his his enduring legacy. So that that's all that I have to say in, in terms of just talking. Well, obviously, I know that there are some questions, so I'm happy to answer those. Thank you so much, Patrick. Um, that was that was fantastic to uh, hear your interpretation um, of Lincoln Alexander's uh, life and his his legacy. I think that there's um, probably many of us who can relate to that um, idea of uh, of Canada being aspirational. Um, and I'm an immigrant as well, um, uh, having moved to uh, this these territories only, um, I guess, about. Uh, been about 10 years or so but uh it feels like um uh you know as an immigrant that there are many places where i can compare with where i've lived previously um and see um areas that are both good uh, you know better and worse right but that um but that we're all trying that everybody here is is trying to make make this um place even better and to make ourselves better um to uh to be worthy of being in this place so um, I just have a few questions and then I'm happy to, you know, take, take questions from the chat. Um, and, uh, I guess we'll, we'll start off with one, um, that, uh, you kind of mentioned a little bit, um, as a black immigrant, Lincoln Alexander paved the way for, for many future generations. And, um, what parts of his story do you think are specific to, to black men or to, uh, immigrants and what parts contain lessons for all Canadians, do you think? Yeah. No, that's a really good question. I think that the um the 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 core aspect of you know what's what's particular to to the black community, I'd say, is this notion that um you know your fate isn't sealed. Uh, you know, it isn't sealed. Uh, and and at least not in this country. Um, I think that there's there's just something inspirational about where he came from and where he ended up. And I, my friends and I often talk about this. Uh, you know, we, we've sort of been been lucky uh, in terms of whatever academic or professional pursuits we've had over the years, and certainly we're we're content with with our um, career pursuits and where we're at. But we we often talk about our own parents who came to this country as immigrants and how um, one of my friends put it really really well when he said to me that you know he could become. Um, he could become prime minister someday or become the richest Canadian, you know, that there is. And he still will not have accomplished as much as his parents did um, in providing him a, 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 an opportunity to essentially chase those types of things. Right. And so I think that that uh, I think that's the lesson that that, that Alexander um, really, really embeds in the black community. To me, it's this notion that, um, you know, he started off at a place where is quite frankly, arguably unfathomable for someone like me. Um, because no matter what, I'll have more resources, more opportunities, more support, and will face likely less discrimination than whatever he had to face, right? Um, and so if someone was in his circumstances and was able to sort of make the most of his opportunity in this country, um, you look at that and you say, well, why can't I? And 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 other um, you know, people of color, uh, especially young black men, um, look at that. And I think this is very key as well, because um, in my article, I talked about how one of the issues when it comes to, to young Black men, um, especially when you're coming from low income um, sort of backgrounds, and, and you know, we know the stereotypes, we know the, um, you know, we, we know what you're almost sort of labeled as in society sometimes without any real opportunity. Um, and sometimes those, those stereotypes are self-fulfilling because we aren't exposed to examples that allow us to believe that we can do more, right? Um, in fact, the examples that we may be exposed to are the ones that confirm that perhaps this is all I can do, right? Um, and so Lincoln Alexander is a very, very um, uh, explicit example of, of what you can accomplish even as a, as a man of color um, in this country now. I think a caveat is important. You know, he he was a man of color, and I think that uh, as, as certainly a lot of literature uh, will attest to. Um, you know, uh, black members of the LGBTQ community, um, black women, you know, may have had a different experience than he did in his time, right? And so it's it's you know it's not. So I think that his example is aspirational in the context of someone from a minority group achieving 
um, great things, uh, despite the the difficulties that they face. Um, I think that's that stands for itself. But I think it is important to dissect that um, you know he still is sort of a a particular group, and 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 the context of terms like uh, you know intersectionality come into play here when when you think that you know someone who was a member of the LGBTQ uh, community, um, and I'd add two S plus here, um, it, you know they would have had a likely different experience than he did. Uh, and obviously, women of color, uh, black women, they would have had different, uh, probably a different experience than he did in terms of uh, achieving the things that he achieved. So, so he stands for a broader um, context, a broader example. As far as um, the particular cha uh, challenges faced by young black men um, coming from um, low income communities, I think he's a great example. Um, but I do think that there's a need to sort of uh, parse out uh, the value of, of, of him as an example, um, because there may be more relevant uh, comparators for, um, you know, for the in the context of intersectionality, there may be more relevant comparators for, for Black women or women of color and, uh, you know, uh, Black members of the LGBTQ2S plus community or, um, or, or any, um, any member of that community that is also uh, a part of a minority group in terms of, uh, you know, being a person of color. So I think those are, are, are things that you think you, you can certainly um, point to. Now, in terms of the larger example of Canada, I think that, you know, there is something to be said about the fact that, um, you know, this is a country that that made that possible for him to pursue those things. Surely not without challenge or resistance. I'm sure he uh, he faced a lot of challenge and, and resistance as he was as he was going ahead. But I think that, you know, his attitude about, you um, you know, not wanting to to pre to present a sort of airbrushed version of history of what Canada is, and recognizing that uh, that we do have a lot of shortcomings as a country, and and you know, I'd go further that our history, you know, certainly is 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 imbued with with moments where we really failed the test time and time again, and I'm sure many would argue uh, that we're still failing the test in some regards. But I think that um, for Canadians, the attitude that he had. That is to say, a, a sort of fundamentally optimistic view um, of what we're capable of as a nation. I think that's something that every Canadian should take in. And then um, understanding that that it's not enough to be optimistic, that there's actually sort of a proactive component to it, that there are things that I can actually do to contribute to, to sort of creating that larger and greater vision of the country that we can have someday. Um, and for me... You know, when I when I learned about Lincoln Alexander, I was working on a project on Martin Luther King and I somehow stumbled on, on Lincoln Alexander. And so I think that the other thing that he's he's taught us and mind you, for me, this was in probably 2005 or six that I learned about him. Um, and since then, a lot has been done to obviously sort of project him as a as a important historical uh, uh, person. Uh, and so I think that. Uh, for the rest of Canadians, doing more to actually get his story out, um, to get uh, to, to get out the, the 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 lessons and the things that he accomplished, I think that also, um, you know, I think that's important because it makes all of all of us, to the extent that 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 you know, many people may have sort of stereotypes or prejudicial views about particular groups. I think he uh, he may sort of help open their eyes to to the fact that um, you know the the black community has played an important. Uh, important role in Canada's history. And, and notably, this is one of the many characters that ha, that has contributed a great deal to, to our progression as a country. That's fantastic. Yeah, I can see that, um, um, you know, just rem remembering him as part of Canada's uh, very recent history, actually, um, mm -hmm. uh, you know, is, is an important part of recognizing the role of, of, of Black people and the community um, in, in really, uh, yeah, helping to make Canada this um, uh, great place and that there are um, role models, you know, and, and for, for everybody, uh, depending on what your identities are um, that, you know, and, and a good reminder that we have both privileged and oppressed identities um, uh, that um, can really, uh, you know, be relatable um, to, mm -hmm. to folks who are looking. So, um, and one of the things that you mentioned about was, um, you know, just a lot of the uh, challenges that he he faced during his time. And so, uh, so my next question is, um, 
around that, um, about how for him, much of the discrimination he experienced was really um, quite explicit, um, uh, probably during his day and 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 conscious um, from the people who were uh you know, really trying to put barriers in his place, um, and not just him individually, but him as part of a uh, a larger group of Black people. Um, whereas I, I feel like today's discrimination against Black people tends to be more implicit and unconscious. And there was actually, I don't know if you saw this, Patrick, a recent ruling on, uh, in BC uh, that there's um, a unconscious bias that uh, applied to a black uh, CFO in Nanaimo. Um, and so, so this was um, uh, the first, I think, uh, human rights tribunal that said there is unconscious bias at play here. And this is a legitimate um, thing. It's not just, you know, uh, people who, who are shouting, shouting racial slurs that can be, uh, you mm -hmm. know, doing this, but, um, but this is, this is very subtle, right. And, and unconscious. Um, and so I'm I'm curious what your recommendations are to to uh, to root out unconscious bias, um, you know, in in our society um, for individuals or as a community as a whole. Yeah, uh, well, I think if I had the answer on how to root it out, I'd uh, probably see my name on a ballot somewhere. And <laughs> and and, uh, and and if I I really had yeah. the answers, then yeah, you know, it, it would. Uh, I'm sure it would be a historic uh, electoral win because uh, mm. obviously this is one of the biggest the biggest challenges um mm. that we face today as a society so yeah. what I'll say is that um just the recognition of of um uh, courts and administrative tribunals and decision makers about the existence of uh, unconscious bias that in and of itself is already I think a, a pretty big jump um and it's been recognized um by numerous decision makers, some of some of them have been in the context of even like criminal law, um, where judges have recognized that that perhaps decisions made by um, by people in authority um, in in deciding to pursue a particular um, uh, you know a, a particular suspect or or the the motives behind th those decisions may have been um, may have been impacted by by unconscious bias and unconscious bias is a very very um, it's a complex subject because it essentially requires that one admit that 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 they may, without knowing, um, you know, be be per perpetrating um, actions or or codes of language or um, you know, sort of uh, unintentional things that that but still harm communities that are comprised of minorities or people of, of color. And so I think that's tough for people to to understand. Um, it's difficult to because because no one um, wakes up saying I'm going to be racist today or I'm going to be you know I'm going to partake in discriminatory behavior today and then you know when you tell them that that's sort of still the case um, in some respects I think it's a it's a challenging thing for people to understand so I think a part of it really is just education I think that's a good place to start for me um, you know a lot of these concepts I didn't really. Um, sort of grasp very much until I went to university and you know, was taking classes and was reading, um, you know, a lot of different uh, writers on on these types of issues, and and I think that that was eye opening to me. Despite despite my own experience, I never really thought of that. I never thought of like what is unconscious bias. Like when I was in high school or middle school, or like I didn't think of these things. You know, you just sort of go about your your day. Um, but but just reading on it and learning about it, I think was super. Uh, was super helpful. I think the the notion of allyship is obviously important. Um, sort of being open to understanding that um, you know, one's one's experience does not represent um, you know, others' experience uh, or others' experiences in that respect. And so, for example, when I was in law school, one of my favorite things about being surrounded by all my classmates was that people had so many different backgrounds and so many different paths. And we here we were all at the same place. People had different paths and different realities and different views, and that that could shape how they analyze a particular legal issue when we hear about it in class, or uh, how they feel about a decision that comes out, and and how they feel about what career path they want to take within the confines of of legal education, right? And so I think that an openness to um, understanding other people's perspectives is extremely important, um, and I think that that helps fight unconscious bias. Uh, and a, a great example is 
you know, I could sit here and talk to you about my experiences as a, a black man in Canada. And, you know, I'm sure you'd hear some things that could shock you. Um, other things that I think would give you a lot of hope about where we're at as a country um, and where we're headed. But at the end of the day, those are my experiences. And, and it may be that my friends that are like me have similar experiences, but ultimately, you know, our experience is not that of a, a black woman or a woman of color is not that of a, a, a black member of the LGBTQ2S plus community or, or a person of color who's a member of that community. And so ultimately you're, you're left with the sense that um, when you, when you analyze all those things, you even have to start asking yourself, like what aspects of my behavior, um, even as a black man could be um, sort of control remnants of unconscious bias, right? And and the key thing, the number one thing is just, you know, am I someone who listens to others' perspectives and listens openly and intently um, and sort of with a, with a real curiosity about um, where they're coming from when they, when they express particular views or ideas? Um, and B, am I someone who's willing to actually get educated on the things that I don't understand, things that don't make sense to me, um, but that could have an impact at that level. And I think that as long as every individual sort of commits to at least doing those two things, um, you know, I think we're already better off than where we are. But obviously, there are larger responses in terms of, you know, what policy objectives, you know, should we have as a, as a country? And, and, you know, what should our education system look like to reflect the need to learn? Those? Like, like, those are all, um, but I think those are certainly beyond the scope of anything that I control. Um, but I think at an individual level, uh, there's just got to be a, a an, an openness and an intent to sort of learn and 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 listen and get to know the people around you, and 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 then you'll see that a lot of our lives are very much shaped by context, and and that is pretty much the definition of un, uh, unconscious bias, because if you don't have someone's context uh, and you only have your context, you're likely going to favor that context over. Um, so, for example, if I'm an interviewer um, for a job or I'm, I'm a recruiter and I see someone's resume and it says that they're uh, a New England Patriots fan. Oh, I'm a New England Patriots fan. I, I love football. Like right away, I'm going to be like, oh, oh this guy, like, I, I, I may genuinely, fundamentally already create views that like, oh, this person would be great to work with just because we have this thing in common. And so the question becomes, what happens when... Um, the things you have in common aren't even as arbitrary as sports, but things as arbitrary as, um, uh, and I say arbitrary in that sometimes you're born in the context you're born in, but things like creed, things like uh, your color of skin, things like socioeconomic experiences, like, you know, those, those things really make a difference uh, as, as much as we can jokingly dismiss, you know, sort of sports, uh, those, those things have a larger impact. So if you're only, close to the to the to the context that you live in you'll never understand those other things and then as a result you're you're almost very much likely to to participate in in uh, unconscious bias i think those are really actionable uh for all of us here right in terms of um people can uh really consider their position and listen um and just say you know how am i going to step back from uh, talking today um, and just listen to other people's experiences and learn, right? And to educate themselves and to say, hey, maybe I'll pick up Lincoln Alexander's book or maybe I'll uh, do some more education myself on um, other uh, people's experiences in my community that I don't know about. Um, but uh, yeah, they're, those are really, really um, concrete things. So thank you for that. Um, and you mentioned something um, that I, I was um, uh, noting was was a similarity. You, you said your experiences in law school also gave you that um, uh, kind of shared experience of other hearing other people's perspectives, right, and where they came from. And of course, Lincoln Alexander also um, graduated from law school. And uh, and I, I'm curious if you think um, uh, legal channels are really the best ways to achieve equity and diversity and inclusion in our society, um, mostly because I feel like a lot of um, uh, things that are happening, um, you know, like movement forward are as a result of like case law or, you know, legislation, um, private members bills, and just like things that are pushing us to, to do things um, in the right way. Um, and, and I'm, I'm curious, like how much of it is more, um, yeah, like, like other, other avenues that are not legal, that's making us kind of like do things. 
Yeah, no, it's a good, good question. I, I mean, I'm not convinced that, uh, yeah, that that sort of the, the formal channels are the, the only ones. I think um, at least the the experience of of um, of the response to, to to injustice against the black community when we look at the states um, was largely fought through informal channels, which then sort of forced, um, you know, legislators to 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 acquiesce to a number of a number of changes. Um, so I think that I think that for for me, my personal view about how you how you implement change on any issue is that um, you first find out what's the easiest way for you as an individual to 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 participate in that issue, right? And so you know, it may not be that um, you know the easiest way is for you to 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 go and and file a lawsuit against someone. It may not be that the easiest way is for you to go sign a number of petitions and. And you know, send them to your local member of parliament or or, or member of provincial parliament. Um, it may be that the you know the easiest thing you can do um, is is bring together a couple of people that you trust and talk about. Hey, I'm looking to get involved in this issue. Like, what what can I do, right? Um, and so I think from that perspective, it's it starts it starts off with that. It starts off with little actions, and I'm sure many of you have um, have heard uh, the the term of the the sort of uh, the the ripples of hope that 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 are often re referenced uh, when people talk about Bobby Kennedy, this notion that like you know one little thing can can have immense consequences around you and can can sort of lead to to bigger actions. But I think that the first thing is always because the problem with with big big actions is that you know I think it encourages this notion of uh, being a, a an inactive participant, right? This idea that oh well, I believe in this cause and you know I um, I supported this with my money or whatever. Like you could, there's all types of way to be involved, but I think nothing nothing creates more ownership on 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 sort of being active when it comes to an issue than the notion of this is what I personally am doing to 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 address this particular issue in my own small way. Sometimes, you know, like it's, it can really be in your own small way, but you're doing something. Uh, and I think that that's, that's not something that people ask themselves often enough. Um, I think um, everyone's always sort of geared towards what's the big thing I can do. What's the big thing I can do. Uh, a perfect example is, um, you know, when we talk about sort of uh, the unequal treatment of, of, of black people in the United States, you know, the first people that I ever sort of read about in, in response to how to deal with racism, how to deal with with issues of uh, of injustice in society. You know, I, I didn't, you know, pick up a Malcolm X book or uh, a Martin Luther King book or a Lincoln Alexander. But like the, the first people that were ever talking to me about injustice uh, were, you know, the rappers that I listened to. Right. Just like and and so in some respects, you know, those people, you know, they, they weren't leading million man marches, you know, in Washington uh, to change the Voting Rights Act or anything like that. They're just making music about, and, and you know, some of that music is about subjects that are dear to them. And um, and I can tell you that, you know, the very first times that I heard about, um, you know, injustice, uh, uh, whether it's vis-a-vis -vis particular systems of power within our society, when you're a person of color, um, you know, those were things I heard of through, through music. And, and, the first time it kind of went over my head. And then over time, you even know the lyrics to songs where they're saying really deep things and you don't know they're saying deep things. And then later on, you learn something, you read something, you're like, oh, that's what that rapper meant. That's what that singer meant when they use that line. And it's like, to me, that's just so incredible. And it's a perfect example of how, um, <clears throat> you know, you can use whatever talents you have, whatever interests you have to really <clears throat> orient um you know, orient to the actions of the, the causes you care about. And so it doesn't have to be, you know, legal. It doesn't have to be legislative. It doesn't even have to be, you know, activism in the pure sense of the word of going out there and protesting. Just take whatever talents you have or interests that you have and find a way to use them as a vehicle to, to make your own impact on that issue. And I'll tell you that, that you're likely to be surprised uh, how far that could take you.
Oh yeah, that's so great. I just feel like so inspired by that because it, it, you know, not not everybody is a lawyer, right? And not everybody is is um going to go through those kind of like formal channels, but that um I think you're you're so right that there's um you know, we all have gifts and what what we uh choose to do with it um can can touch other people and uh and that um that can be a variety of things. So so I feel like that's a really empowering message. Thank you. Um of course, Brat Shaw is um an educational institution and so for us, that is um, a, a really um, key way uh, that, you know, we we get get the message out, so to speak. And Lincoln and Alexander, of course, believe in ensuring access to education and opportunities uh, for Canada's youth. And uh, and I, I wonder, um, you know, are there ways um, that Sprotshaw can remove barriers to post-secondary education, in your opinion? Um, we, we do provide scholarships and we look at um, applications in, in a very holistic way. Um, but yeah, are there any other suggestions that you have? Yeah, I think just the, the fact that you provide scholarships and, and other um, sort of opportunities are, are great. I, for me, I wouldn't be here today if not for if not for scholarships. Um, so, you know, obviously the, the difficult thing when you're coming from a particular background, especially when you aren't exposed to people like you who've gone on post-secondary um, or maybe not in your immediate sort of life, um, is that it's hard to envision um it's hard to envision yourself in those spaces, right? And so I think that uh, things like scholarships make it possible. Now, some of those issues is it's hard to envision yourself there because you legitimately ask yourself, can I afford to go to post-secondary? Some of it is, well, if I went, what would I even study? Like, um, what am I good at? I'm not good at any, like you have a lot of these sort of moments of doubt um, that, that tend to creep in. And so things like scholarships at least allow to, to deal with one aspect of it. Um, I'm not convinced that uh, that there are enough scholarships out there. So obviously you could always create more. Uh, but the other, the other piece is that um, I'm also not convinced in the notion of just giving um, someone money or just paying for their schooling. I think that there has to be more mentorship that's uh, sort of attached to that, right? And, and to, so, so as to say that, hey, we're giving you an opportunity to pursue an education for, uh, you know, at a lower cost or at no cost, um, but that's not enough. You know, you have to provide um, young people, young people of color with a network, um, an opportunity for mentorship, um, you know, ideally from people that they can sort of see themselves in, um, but it doesn't have to be restricted to that. Um, it can be anyone, anyone that has any, any profession that they're interested in um, to sort of teach them you know, this is what you should be thinking about. This is what you, you know, one of the things that when I was in school, you know, we'd, we'd have these bring your kids to work day and um, I'd come back and, you know, I couldn't go with my mom because she was working, you know, sort of overnight shifts. She's a, a PSW um, and essentially could, you know, couldn't bring me, <laughs> you know, to work a graveyard shift. Uh, and so she'd sort of, you know, have me tag along with some friend who did something, but, you know, not, you know, it wasn't a, not not at the level of my classmates when I came back in the classroom who talked about spending their day at the dentist, spending their day with their parent that's an engineer, spending their day with an accountant. In some respects, yes, lawyers, doctors, but even just you know, oh, my dad is a is an analyst at the government. You know, things like that. Like we, there was no exposure to that, and so that sort of would limit any notion of okay, that's something that I could do. Um, and so I think that linking those scholarships to more opportunities where these young people get to see themselves um, in a particular profession, in a particular space. And there are programs here in Ottawa that I've been even involved with myself um, that, uh, for example, will bring, will bring kids from, uh, from low income housing. Um, you know, it's a, it's a program, it's fundraised, and they'll be brought over to, uh, to the university for a week, for a couple of days to take essentially ghost classes but just to see like what it's like, like to be, you know, at a university, at a college, to be to be in that space. And, they, you know, they, they have professors come in and give, uh, you know, give get like lectures and give give presentations, talk to them about particular subjects. They have professionals come in and talk to them about particular careers. And, oh, this is what I had to study to get here. Um, and in some respects, they also have um, an extension of the program where they place those students in workplaces for a week or so so they can actually see and so I think that um, that's something that that any post-secondary um, institution should should 
you know, to the extent that it's possible, really try to engage themselves more in um, just sort of understanding that, uh, you know, we're not just giving you an amount of money or, or alleviating a, a, a cost that we're also providing you with a network um, and, and an opportunity for real mentorship. Um, and to the extent that it's possible, opportunities that could actually um, have you be exposed to the very things you'd like to do, because it's you're going to be more inspired when you're in school, when you say, oh, no, I saw what a lawyer does and I know that I can do that. And I know I can do it. But if you've never seen it, it's all, you know, the first time I set foot basically in a law firm was the day I, I went to, to, to do a job interview for where I work today. Um, and I can tell you that many of my classmates, that wasn't their experience. Um, they'd been exposed to, to law firms a lot more than I had. And I think that was um, that was daunting when I was there because it creates sort of a, uh, a sense of uh, not necessarily anxiety because there's always a confidence that I could do it. But but, um, you know, the, uh, the the notions of imposter syndrome are, are greater in, in situations like that. Um, and then the, the other thing, too, is that um, if you've just never if you don't have anyone in your immediate family or you have like you also have concerns of, OK, well, I'm in school, but. How am I going to turn this into an opportunity to to get a job and things of that nature when you've got classmates who who have relationships and connections within the legal industry, right? And so, and I imagine that that that's the reality for for anybody who's in any profession where they don't have those relationships. Um, and so, I think that any opportunity that creates those types of relationships for young people, um, especially young people of color or, or for minority groups, uh, will make a huge difference. Yeah, I think so. I think the representation uh, aspect of it is, is so important for people to actually visualize like somebody who looks like me is doing something like that. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, that really gives them a, an idea. Um, Crystal is asking from uh, the audience, um, if you happen to know, did Lincoln Alexander have any children? And if yes, did they follow in his lead in politics? He did have children. Um, mm -hmm. No, no. Uh none in politics as far as uh, I'm mm. aware of. Um, no, I don't think any of them are in politics, but many of them um, tend to sort of uh, appear when there's like a, a special on TV or like those are the, those are the times that I've, I actually uh, a couple of years ago um, appeared on, uh, on, on a, a news sort of segment where one of his, his kids or grandkids was, was involved. Um, wow. But yeah, but yeah, but he did have, uh, he did have kids. Yeah. Okay. Great. Um, yeah. Marissa says he had a son named uh, Keith. I think Marissa uh, grew up in the same hometown he did and um, who passed away. And then granddaughter Erica uh, speaks on his behalf um, and is involved. Um, and, and speaking of involvement, I think that, um, you know, based on both uh, Lincoln Alexander's legacy and your own experiences, um, I'm curious about uh, what, what advice do you have for our international students who are tuning in, um, who, you know, they've immigrated to Canada, they, you know, for their studies, and, and they, they want to make this place, uh, as you say, aspirational, um, and uh, a place um, that, that is, is worthy of them being here. Um, how should they become more involved with specific engagement. Um, yep. and, and we'll close off with this question. Yeah. So I'd say it's sort of, as I mentioned earlier, um, you know, it's, it's all about finding something that you care about that you can make a difference in. Um, you know, I know that for me, when I first got involved in my community, you know, the work I was doing had nothing to do with, um, sort of, uh, you know, racial injustice or anything of that nature. It was, I was just fundraising, um, for the local sick kids hospital here, um, because everyone that I knew had a story there. We, we the place here is called Chio, and everyone would often say everyone has a Chio story. And so for me, I was like, okay, well, I, 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 I had broken my finger at some point, and I went there, and they helped me, and I just got, I want to give back. How do I do it? And so it's all about just finding the thing that you're passionate about that 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 allows you to give back. Because the thing about um, civic engagement is that you know you've got a lot of other obligations. Uh, personal ones, professional ones, um, perhaps even academic ones, as obviously as a student. And, and so the things that you're involved in can take a lot of work and a lot of energy out of you. Um, and so sort of fundamentally, it has to be something you're passionate about. It has to. If it's not something you're passionate about, you know, why, why would you choose to do that thing instead of hanging out with your friends on the weekend or spending time with your family or, you know, studying for school or, 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 you know, sort of learning more skills to allow you to, to flourish professionally, right? It has to be something that you're passionate about, that you feel a calling to, to sort of contribute to. And 
I just don't think anyone, there's anyone out there that can say there's nothing I'm passionate about. Like everyone's got something, right? Um, a perfect example, uh, when I was in high school and was on student council, we were trying to fundraise again for, for the local sick kids hospital. And, and our school had a lot of different fundraisers. You know, you go knock on doors, we, we did different things. And our student council thought, okay, well, how can we get as many people as possible to like donate money to this cause? And like what we did was we organized a, a video game tournament at our high school um, for, for Madden football, uh, which is, you know, it's just a super popular game when I was in high school, probably still is to, to this day. Um, and, and at our school, it was, there were a lot of football players and non-football players who played this game. And it was a big deal to have the bragging rights to say you were the best. And we would have these informal tournaments like at people's houses and all we did was, listen, we're passionate about this. We care about this. And we love playing video games. Let's just get everyone in a room at the school and get them all to pay 20, 30 bucks and, you know, to, to, to participate in this tournament. And we're going to, we'll, we're going to have used something that we literally do anyways to make a difference in our community. And we did that and it was a, an absolute hit. And then later on, we organized a charity concert, which was also a hit. Like, so it's just like, it, it doesn't have to be, anything intricate you know where you're just like i think fundraising just sounds like i don't know it sounds like you're you're outside somewhere ringing a, a bell asking people to give you money um for a particular cause and also that's another great way to do it if you love it i mean i knocked on doors for years for for some of the causes that i care about um but there you just have to find a cause that you're passionate about and then find a strategy that that, that you you find interesting entertaining fun or even challenging. And I think those, the combination of those two things, something will come to you and, and you'll give it your all. And, and you, you'll see the best part and a feeling that, that I'm constantly trying to replicate is once you've achieved that goal, it was like, you know, we're, we're giving back to the community in whatever humble way we can. Once you've done it that first time, the feeling is going to stick with you and you're going to want to do it again and again and again. And then it'll be second nature. And then there are there are other things that you you learn from those experiences that aren't even intended consequences. You learn so much about teamwork. You learn so much about how to be a leader. You learn so much about how to be a member of a team. You learn so much about planning and and you know what to do when things absolutely go up in the air and and you've got no hope of of a particular thing you know happening an event. You know how to salvage that situation. You also learn how to deal with disappointment. You know when some of those goals aren't achieved. You know, who are you in those moments? And I think that um, I, I learned a lot more through my work uh, in the community than I did in any other area of my life. Um, and so I'd encourage uh, anyone who's interested to certainly get going. But you start by figuring out what's the cause I care about and, you know, what is the thing that, I, that I'm that i passionate about that I could do to, to raise awareness or raise funds for this cause. I think that's a, a, a great way to to end this session and to for us to find out you know what what is it that we both cared about and um and you know are are good at passionate about and so um thank you thank you so much for those those words um and thank you for being here today Patrick I really enjoyed uh, speaking with you and enjoyed the session um thanks so much to everybody in the audience um we will uh, end here take care everybody thanks everyone okay. thanks see ya.